check. Good. Okay, excellent. Any other any other insights on why the narrator is not cooperating? Yes. I thought that she was just so grief stricken that she was saying, you know, like I'm I should be named bitterness because of what is what God has basically put me through. And I feel like the text is rejecting that, like God is still with you. God is still with you. I like that, right? In a way it's yeah. like, no, you're you're still you don't see it, right? But your name is still Naomi, right? You don't see your future yet, right? The name is the destiny. So even if you don't see the fact that you don't see your destiny doesn't mean it's not gonna happen, right? So in a way, right, that there's a kind of faithfulness of God, maybe, or faithfulness of her future, even though she's shaken, something is not shaken, right? It could be God or the plan for her life or her destiny. Something remains unshaken. And the, the narrator is highlighting that. No, you remain now. Your destiny doesn't change, right? Uh, very interesting. Um, she, doesn't, she doesn't herself understand what God's role is in her life. At this point, and um, what how precious it is. But the narrator is indicating that it's to come, and um, that she hasn't gone downward. Um, that her life, her bitterness would pass. Okay, very good. Actually, this is reminding me of something really interesting I want to share with you. It's slightly unrelated, but about the the. How we, the steadfastness, fa, ah, steadfastness of our destinies. In other words, we have a destiny and we can mess it up, but we can, I'll show you something. Um, this, this has helped me so much in life. How many of you, by the way, have made or will make terrible mistake that you feel will change the course of your destiny? Anybody? Not yet. You're too young. Yeah, you already. Okay, good. Anybody else made a, a destiny changing? Like, in other words, you made that mistake. You're like, I was meant to have this, but now it's over. Anybody else? It will come, don't worry. Uh, yes, you, you too, very good. Two, slide, slightly, okay. You also? Yeah, you're older than I thought. Okay. <laughs> and then we have the young in spirit. <laughs> so this will happen, don't worry. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, uh, we too, right? All of us. So we have, we're set up to go you know, in this direction. And very often, inevitably in life, we will come to a point where we make a terrible mistake, which in a way begins to shift our destiny, right? In this way. And it, it, these are the consequences, right? You know how they say when you make a mistake, God forgives, but the consequences remain. I beg to differ on that. Let me explain. So here you are. You make a terrible mistake. Maybe it's a, it's a sin. Maybe it's, you know, a stupid decision. Maybe it's a, a foolish decision. It doesn't matter. Now you are here with the consequences. Um, what I've noticed in my own life is that when you come to this point where you realize, damn, I made a mistake. <laughs> Or, or, you, or you finally accept that you sin <laughs> because it's 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 not easy right to accept that we sin we say ah it was justified you know i had to do it you know and we kind of justified for a little while and we continue going in this direction one day you're like okay <laughs> that was a clear mistake i i messed up right at that moment this is what i believe happens of course you can't go back to the past you can't go back to this point guess where you go where oh where where is my point Future. You go straight up? No. Oh, you take this little detour. <laughs> where do you end up? I'm trying to go back to the original. Exactly. This is where you end up. Learn this. <laughs> In other words, people say, oh, you sin. God forgives, but the consequences remain. I, I beg to differ. God forgives and you're back on track, right? Yeah, you can't go back there. That's true. Can't, can't fix that. But you find yourself back on your trajectory. That is how steady our destiny is, right? Um, of course, if we are able to make that turn back, but most of us, the problem with us, we continue, right? And we can miss our destiny. This is why it's so important at times to sit down and be like, okay, what did I do wrong? You know, sit down and repent, basically. <laughs> right? What did I do wrong? How can I do better? Because that is actually very powerful. The act of repentance is not just, ah, oh, you know, God will cleanse me from my sins. Who cares, right? The act of repentance can get you back to the destiny that you were about to miss, right? So something similar is happening here with Naomi, right? She was meant to be something. And then they made a terrible mistake. What was it? Moving to Noah. Yeah, and the text highlights that, right? You notice that her husband uh, dies, her two sons terrible names right you you highlight sickness and destruction they die right so you can sense okay 
she's she's moving away from from light right she's she's heading this way and then she gets to the point where she realizes i made a terrible mistake and she says i'm gonna go back to bethlehem right and of course she is thinking right she's still thinking it's over this is her name mara right bitterness she's still thinking even she's going back to bethlehem she's continuing on this terrible trajectory where you know where, where there is nothing but death but somehow, as the moment she decides to, to return, which is, by the way, is the technical word for repentance. In the Hebrew, repentance literally means return. So there's a whole story here. Kind of a, let me write this down. Yeah, right? Which is translated as repentance. Actually, literally means to return. So we have kind of a story of sin and repentance, right? Transgression and repentance, where in a way she, she returns and somehow, you know, I mean, if you read the rest of the story, you see that she gets back on track. She's She goes back to her destiny of being Naomi, right? Am I making sense? Is, uh, isn't this amazing news? I mean, <laughs> y'all should be jumping up and down. No, Epstein? Do you... what the... Back to where, the, the line, the trajectory. Yeah, but what destiny does she have? Well, Naomi. Uh, which means uh, pleasant. Yeah, but what, what destiny does she have? Because that's what she does. Oh, well, the, the lady. She, the court, uh, she forces people to do things. But <laughs> she herself does not have a destiny. After this, she's done. She, Except the last. No descendant. She has no name. She has no. Have you seen the, the ending? Or... I have seen the ending. It doesn't come from her. Where, and... where they place the baby in her lap? That, that's what that's I mean. It's family. problematic. I agree. It's problematic. It's why, they, you know, for After Ruth also. She, Ruth is not done. Ruth has a uh, a whole kingdom to build on her. But remember, she becomes a grandmother. It's not so bad. <laughs> I never said our life was. Are there. you a grandmother yet? <laughs> not yet. Okay. Okay. So what I mean is, there is, you know, there is an opening that happens. Yes, it's indirect. It's not through her blood directly, right? It's not with her son, but there is an opening clearly in Naomi's life, right? A, at least economic, <laughs> right? <laughs> But you should not disregard the extent of relationships between people who are not related to one another. <laughs> people get divorced and they still maintain relationships with family that's not really their family because they are inclusive in their family. Not everybody has bitter experience at some point. You know, people go through other things in life, you know, that doesn't mean that. Every single person from the marriage gets cut off to them because that marriage ends in some way when the death is or whatever. Yeah. You're too young to have experienced. <laughs> 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 You're, you're gonna judge all right y'all okay okay, okay. you're in a bad mood too i see there's two of us <laughs> epstein is with me today we are in the same mood welcome welcome to to my reality <laughs> all right moving on so uh that's the first thing right i wanted to share with you this notion of um yes now uh with the name very very nicely uh uh but now, Suresh, you mentioned very uh, pointedly the notion of the garden mentality. We all know what that is, right? The capacity to receive. This is truly the gift of Ruth, right? Why she becomes eventually saturated, right? In which we learned that's the, one of the meanings of her name, is that she is so open, right? And we're going to look at this in the text. We're going to see when she begins to, in a way, swell open, right? And and why and how that makes her so uh, uh uh, saturated in the end, right? So very nice. Uh, Epstein, yes, you observe correctly. In this text, clearly Mother's House text, most of the dialogues between women, very strong female characters. Boaz, in the end, by the way, emerges. By the way, you don't have, in, in all of the texts we're studying, right, the man eventually emerges very powerfully. We saw that with Adam, right? Adam was a kind of, where, <laughs> where was he? But then in the end, you saw how he masterfully right, uh, revokes the divine decree of death and, and names, changes the course of Eve's destiny. So you, you the in, in a way, the women start out very powerfully in many of these texts and eventually the men uh, uh, reflect that, right? So we have an equally strong man here in the text, which will come in Boaz, described, by the way, in very, there's a clear parallel between Boaz and Ruth. They're both described as uh, Chayil, 
uh, which means uh, strong. And we'll look at uh, even deeper the meaning of Hail. Hail is military metaphor. Soldier is Hayal, right? So Hayal means strong in a military way, right? Very uh, powerful. Both are described, so the, the text kind of puts them in a, a kind of um, equivalency, right? Um, Davidov, uh, yes, so we mentioned the mistake. <laughs> now, just on this notion of the redeeming kinsman, so Boaz, what is exactly his role? Let me be clear on that. There are two kinds of redemptions uh, in the ancient Israel. The first one is if you're, if you're a woman and your husband dies and you have no kids, you are allowed or you are commanded to marry the brother. Okay, so this is in order that, and, and, and then you end up, you know, and sometimes the union is just for one night, just to have the child. And then you are kind of living in the household as a, not really as a wife, but as a family member, they, he doesn't go back, you know, with her. Sometimes they stay with <laughs> right, lovers. But in general, the idea is you impregnate her, right? And then she can have kids and people to uh, take care of her, right? When she gets old. So uh, that's the first kind. Now, this is not who Boaz is. He's not the brother. He's not, right? None of that. Um, it, there's another kind of redeeming, which you have to understand, which is sometimes uh, people would go into debt. And they would become so indebted that they had to sell their land to pay off their debts. And then they end up with nothing. And this is kind of probably the story of Naomi. She 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 sold her land. She has now no backup. And she spent the money, clearly, because they left. They went to Moab. She's penniless. But she's not only penniless, she's landless. And so in that case, there was a provision that a family member could, in those cases, go and buy the land back and bring it back into the family, right? That's what Boaz is supposed to do, right? So uh, that's so in that sense, marrying Ruth is an extra thing, right? So, and, and one of you asked a very pointed question, why doesn't Naomi just go to Boaz and say, please redeem my land and so forth? Anybody know what she, yes? Oh, no, I think that was me. That was your question. It's a good question. Why doesn't she just go up and say, hey, I'm back, I'm poor, you know, give me my land, you know? Why doesn't she do that? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So she may have no land. Ah, very good. Very good. And that land is being owned by somebody else at this point. He's entitled to the rents and produce, whatever he's getting for that year anyway. He's not going to get anything right away. Exactly. Um, and he's, okay, he's not helping this much. He's the husband's husband. Mm -hmm. So if he would do that for, for her husband. Yeah, but why for her, right? Her. Yeah, why very good. She's not, she's not relation of her. So she might be refused, right? Yeah. And so what does she do? Very smart, cunning, female wisdom. <laughs> if you know the rest of the story, just to see a little bit how twisted this whole thing is. What does she, Epstein, you'd be the best person to ask. <laughs> In your mood, you'll catch it. <laughs> what does she do? She sends him a pretty young girl. To exactly. You got it. <laughs> I knew you'd get it. She manipulates this man. So it, it's exactly what's going on. I want you to measure this. She's extremely cunning. She's like, huh, let's just kill three birds in one stone. Get her married. Get my land back. Right? Oh, no, two birds. <laughs> two birds in one stone. Get her married and get my land back. And that's when we'll see that next time, of course, the seduction of Boaz. But you see how she's much smarter than just going up and, you know, risking a refusal. She's like, if she seduces him, I get everything, <laughs> right? Including my this, this woman that has been with me might get married and so forth and be cared for. So this is a lot, very nicely done, Epstein. I knew I could count on you. This <laughs> is exactly what's going on, right? Very cunning. A smart maneuver here by by Naomi. So does that answer your question, Korkora? <laughs> and and you too, right? Who was asking about the 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 Hebrew word is goel, G O E L, right? For redeemer, very important word because uh, we saw. Remember in the book of Genesis, this is important in our context of um, sacred marriage. Um, you know, uh, theme. We know that in Genesis 2, the woman is called the Ezer of man, right? She's the, you know, kind of a savior, right, of man. 
she has this uh, very powerful divine role. Turns out the man too has a saving role in the life of woman. And here we see it with Boaz, right? So, and we saw with Adam, right? So both in a way redeem each other, right? That's, that's a, a, not in ancient Near East, right? Ancient Near East cultic text, it's just a woman, the goddess, right? Is the one who is doing all the, although the, to be honest, the goddess is also uh, fertilized by the king, right? So uh, as a result, she becomes fertile and the whole world um, blossoms, right? This is the idea, remember, uh, when uh, the sacred marriage ceremony, the king uh, and the goddess uh, uh, are intimate. As a result, the king is empowered to rule and the goddess is fertile and then and, and the whole world begins to bloom. So we have something similar in the biblical text where they kind of empower each other, right? This is kind of what I'm seeing over and over again. Here, we'll see that in the Song of Songs, in the Book of Esther, and so forth. Okay, great. Um, Davido. Yes, I got you. Okay, Kaplan. Um, okay, here we go. Why did Orpa go back? <laughs> and why did, you know, so why, yeah, what, what is, why would Orpa not follow her mother-in-law? What's, what's her calculation? These women are all calculating. <laughs> I mean... I because what Naomi said was right, like you have a better chance of getting remarried if you go back to your people and you're, you're not going to live in poverty with me and you're going to be able to have kids of your own and I have nothing to offer you. Very good. But Orpa is going to highlight the depth of Ruth's sacrifice, which we're going to talk about, right? So Orpa is doing the normal thing, <laughs> rational thing. Ruth, on the other hand, is half crazy. Mm -hmm. also knows that the chances of Naomi and them surviving the third person is going to be a lot more. You're so charitable to Orpa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the rabbis hate her. Who is she? The do you know? Do you know who is her descendant? Goliath. <laughs> That's what the rabbis do with Orpa. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. You know, I'm not going to make this suffering more. I mean, the third person here. I like it. It's not necessary. And it's going to, you know, everybody, this whole family is going to break up. All right. I'll, I'll give you that. Is, but, you know, she, yeah, she could have, she may have a much better chance. Very good. Excellent. Maybe she's less dependent. Okay, sure. Yeah, we can do that. We can, we can do that. The rabbis disagree with you, but we can. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. And it's not in the textbook, right? And Corcoran, I think I've addressed your your stuff. Okay, <laughs> let us get into the text. Okay, so now now that we've mentioned all the characters <laughs> and the backdrop, and we have a little better sense as to what is going on, I want to zoom in on Ruth, of course, because she's the one who's going to, whom we want to emulate, right? She's the one. Remember, the goal of this whole study is to see how do you go from wilderness to, to saturation, from, from desert to providence. Ruth, in a way, is paving the way. The The day that you find yourself a, a stuck or, you know, in a desert, the book of Ruth is, it has a lot of uh, wisdom, right? Not just for women, for men too. So, so first of all, I want us to measure the depth of Ruth's uh, sacrifice, right? When she's going with uh, Naomi, what she's giving up on, because remember, she she knows, I mean, she's a, she's already older, right? She's probably middle-aged. At least that's what people assume. Uh, probably have, if she has trouble having kids, right? We know that from the text. She's probably already a little bit more advanced than just somebody, you know, possibly. We're not sure, right? Possibly not. Possibly not. We, yeah, we don't have any certainty on anything. We can do that. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, she didn't. She wasn't really uh, lucky there either. So she's she's going back where probably there is no marriage at the horizon, right? Because she's older. She's going to another people who are not supposed to intermarry, right? With with Moabites. So she's going in a very uh, problematic space. Um, why is she doing it? Why is she so adamant on doing it? Um, what would happen to Naomi, in other words, if Ruth didn't make this decision? Yeah. I think, like, she had the foresight to know that she would have, like, lost herself completely. She was very, like, on a path where she was, like, being very negative and her mind was, I guess, expiring. So by going with her, she she has somebody to keep her in check. 
Good. So emotionally, Naomi is spiraling. But what are the other risks at the time when when you have no husband, no sons? What are you in those in those times, in those particular times? What happens to you as a woman if you don't have sons and husband? You're a widow, so you're just considered. I mean, the widows and poor people stuck in poverty are grouped together as the same type of people in the Bible a lot. Exactly. And who who takes care of the widow and the orphan? God. Yes, but <laughs> right. Realistically speaking, <laughs> why God? Because no one else, <laughs> right? So, so she's really in those times. If you're single with no husband, no sons, it's over for you. You're a beggar, right? You're a beggar. You depend on the charity of people, and if they give you, that's great. If they don't give you, you're finished, right? So. So Ruth knows this and she realizes if I don't go with this woman, she will die, <laughs> right? She will die either emotionally or of poverty. Uh, and so in a way, she she sacrifices her own future life, right? In order to preserve this woman's life, right? So she makes in a way the ultimate, almost the ultimate sacrifice, right? There is something, it's it, it's it's a very powerful act of, and, and you know, by the way, Naomi, how does she react to Ruth's humongous sacrifice? <laughs> it's, it's, let's see, let's look at the text. Um, so Ruth, you know, she makes this big declaration. My people will be your people. Let me, let's find it. Um, so Naomi says, turn back. I'm on verse eight. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, he tells her to turn back several times. Right. Uh, and then finally, uh, Orpah leaves. Wait. Um, Ruth demands to stay. She says, you know, my people will be, I mean, your people will be my people, the very famous text. And then when Naomi determined she, she was going to go with her, what did she do? She did that she was. Yeah, she ceased to argue with her and then, and so forth. That's it. She's just like, you know what, whatever. And then she, <laughs> there's no like, thank you, my daughter. And she kisses her and weeps, you know, in her arms. None of that. There's no sign of gratitude, nothing. Right? She's just like, okay, whatever fine come right so this is like this whole huge sacrifice almost undeserved right yes i think it's the situation is so bleak and she's grieving yeah. you know so i don't i don't think she has the energy exactly no no that's exactly it right absolutely it's not that she's a bad person it's like she's so exhausted she's like okay so we see here the first act of chesed right that i mentioned that ruth is going to perform remember two times out of the four 50 percent <laughs> Of the loving kindness is going to be ascribed to Ruth, right? So, 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 so I wanted you to really measure this, right? Really, what Ruth is doing is ending her life, is giving her life for the sake of this woman, right? This is really, she's in a way sacrificing her dreams, she's sacrificing her womanhood, she's sacrificing her future just to keep this woman alive, right? Now, in a way, she has a forfeited her life uh, yeah i just want to ask like but if ruth if ruth had went back to moab and wouldn't she basically be in the same position that naomi would have been in alone that she's also unmarried with no children she's also kind of and poor you mean uh, no because she goes back to her her house her father her mother's yeah. house so she has right. people to take care of right. her right yeah. naomi doesn't right she she has her mother still she has all the people naomi is very very much alone mm -hmm. so okay so yes yeah so i mean you, you you'll probably get to this later but what do you think this says about the tests of preserving of her foreignness if she completely abandons her foreignness to, to a degree that like no other convert ever that are in this text well, i guess we all talk about them much but to it to a very high degree yeah yeah it, that's a good point right the text maintains it there's a reason but it, it for sure she's given up maybe not so much her foreignness as her ego right this is her right we could say that she doesn't bring any customs or nothing but the text is you you can't get around this right that the text maintains her otherness for a reason right i i think i think there's a strategic reason why the narrator maintains her her foreignness but you're right she has really emptied herself of everything right she's yes she doesn't just do this and say okay i'll go with you we'll get back home we'll get on your feet whatever and i can go on my way she's 
fighting to be with her yeah. brother and trying to wife. Exactly. It's almost like a yeah. It's almost a, it's a covenant, right? That she's making with her. It's 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 as serious as a marriage, right? This is I'll be with you forever, right? So okay. So exactly. No matter, no matter what my says or appeal it does, she's never going to agree. Very good. Now she has in a way emptied herself. What happens next in the story? And then we're going to look at the connection. What is the next thing that happens, right? They arrive and then Naomi sends her on a task. How does she come back from this task? Yes. And she comes back happy, more or less, and with actual food that they could use to sustain themselves. And with Very, good. About the right. Very good. So she enters, she has emptied herself. And somehow what we see in the story is that this is when things begin to happen for her right the moment so she has emptied herself and we see that the next stage right we have the the next moment we have a chapter two where it says uh, so naomi sends her to glean wherever right um they mentioned boaz in passing sends her to glean and by chance the text says this is chapter two i mentioned this earlier right by chance uh so this is chapter two verse uh three right um Mikre, right? Let me write it down. It's an important verb. And it happens by chance. Mikre is chance. Right? By chance, she stumbles onto the field of precisely the man that they've been thinking about, right? Uh, and then, of course, everything shifts for her, right? This is the beginning of a, uh, this is a turning point for her. Okay, and then of course we we as you read further, you will see how she enters into a life of more and more abundance. Now, this little chance thing is interesting because in he, in this particular text, uh, you don't see anything but luck. But the same expression is used, and now we can interpret it in Deuteronomy. Uh, sorry, in Genesis twenty four twelve. Did I mention this last time? Okay, let's go there briefly again. <laughs> right, Genesis twenty four twelve. Um, so what, what's the story I mentioned last time where the same expression is used? You remember? Uh, Cain and Abel. Nope. Or, so I didn't talk about it. <laughs> no, wait, I think you did that. Jacob. No, not Jacob. Uh, almost. Joseph. Joseph? No, nope, before. <laughs> Abraham? No, after. Uh, Y'all did all the patriarchs except the right one. Isaac. Isaac, yes. <laughs> so it's time for Isaac to get married, right? Abraham sends his servant out to his kin. Uh, in the east to find a woman the servant arrives and uh, he prays he's clueless how to pick this woman he has no experience with women <laughs> how do i do this and he prays right and you there's a supplication in his prayer we have the word now but he says please grant me chance right same word grant me chance that i'm going to find that woman and immediately of course uh, Re uh, rebecca uh, arrives on the scene and clearly she's the one blah 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 and so, so in this text, you clearly have the connection between Mikhe and God's action, right? So in that sense, we can go back to our text and say, well, God is hiding, but perhaps God is also behind this, pulling the strings, right? So the echo, right, is, is, is giving us the hint that perhaps God is beginning to pull some strings, right? Okay, so, and of course, um, the question we can ask is, what makes him pull the strings now? And not before. I mean, the, the life of Ruth has been a life of tragedy. But right? even of Naomi, the husband dies. First uh, son-in-law dies. Second son-in-law dies. There's a famine. We're going back. And now her name is bitterness. Tragedy after tragedy, loss after loss. Why is it that God only begins to move now? What did, in a way, so, so yeah, what provoked God? What woke God up in, in a way? How can we wake God up in, the, in also? I'm going to guess it's the emptying of Ruth, that the fact that she completely abandoned everything is what opened her up to God's Yes, rest. now you're getting to know my mind and you can predict my thoughts. <laughs> Good sign. Yes. Uh, 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 yes, go ahead. You have to take action. Excellent, excellent. Let's write both of these thoughts down. Number one, but what kind of human action? The initiative. Uh, yes, what kind of initiative is it? It's, 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 I wrote it on the board. 
Yes, it yes. right yes. exactly. So it's not just any action like oh, let me go get a job, right? There is an an element, but I uh, so so you might be right that you don't need the action of Chesed. Before. The text, however, seems to show right. I'm, I'm going to go in that direction. Right. Say that it's kind of the show. Say disinterested piety here is totally important. Oh yes, yes. That's the has a value that is so high. Yeah. That God. Why? Because Job, what's the difference between Ruth's chesed and Job's piety? There's a clear difference why God is moving for, for Ruth and not Job. Well, she do it than anything, anything exactly. Job, remember, his piety is for himself, <laughs> right? It's about him. He's the center of the universe. Ruth, on the other hand, her her her, her chesed is, is completely poured out to another. And that's when God notices, right? So you have exactly a reversal of Job. That would be a great test question, right? How does Ruth reverse Job, right? I, I like it. Um, but, right, the reason is they're both good people, but in a very different way. Job is good for himself, right? Ruth is good for the other. She There's absolutely zero ego in, in her actions. So it's as though, in a way, so two things. Let me summarize what you all said, right? So one, one thing we could say generally, God, God responds to our actions, right? And this, I want to stop on that a little bit and then get into what you were saying. Because I, I tell people, you know, very often people are waiting to know God's will before doing anything. That will happen to you guys when you're faced with marriage. Oh, I'm waiting to know God's will. I had a friend like that. He was waiting to know God's will year after year, right? Um, or, or you're trying to... Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Not nothing, <laughs> right? Or you're waiting to know which path you should take and you're waiting, right? The This is a, one of the laws you need to learn about metaphysical laws. God doesn't act till you act. Until you take a step, there can be no guidance. God is not going to come to you in a dream and be like, take this step. You got to start walking. And as you begin to walk, God begins to open and close doors, right? So I always tell people, if you're uh, confused, should I do this or that? Should I marry this person or that person? Should I go to this university or that university? Start, take one baby step, even if it's the wrong one, take it. And then things will begin to shift. In other words, go on that date. Or, you know, make that phone call or apply to these universities or, you know, try, you know, take a step. It doesn't have to be a wedding ring. It's just take a step, right? Take a small step, any step, even the wrong step. And immediately then God can, right? God only responds to human movement. God movement responds to human movement. No human movement, no God movement, right? So that's the first. So I like the way you put it because that's kind of what's happening here. Now, I want to go deeper, though. The, the type of action is the chesed. In other words, her emptying of herself creates the space for abundance. It is precisely because she emptied herself that she received so much. We are clearly in the garden mentality, right? So her action is an action of emptying, of opening, of releasing, right? She releases her destiny. She empties herself of her own uh, ego. And this, in a way, is the is the most profound action you can do to receive divine providence, right? Um, there's a similar story, uh, which we'll probably study in the book of John on the Samaritan woman, um, which where, where Jesus is teaching her the same that, that we're learning here, right? The notion of if you want abundance, uh, you, in a way, have to first learn to empty yourself, to, to surrender, right, to 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 give up let's talk about that a little bit why is there a connection between the emptying of your dreams aspirations will desires and the receiving of abundance what what is the connection let's elaborate on that a little bit to understand better the mechanism <clears throat> why does god not give abundance until we learn to empty ourselves of what we want. <laughs> yeah. You, know, like, you can think of it as giving up control to him. You just kind of like realize that whatever is meant for you is going to be meant for you. And you don't have to worry about everything that you can't control. Yeah, I like that. In other words, I, I learned that also. Um, when we stop controlling, that's when we, in a way create the space for God to control, right? As long as you're hanging on to it, God is like, give it to me, give it to me, let me fix it. It's like, no, no. <laughs> right? So in a way, the relinquishing of control, right? Uh, the, the interruption of our actions is what really gives space, creates the space for the divine action. If you want God to intervene, 
at one point you have to stop. So it's kind of the opposite, what you're saying, <laughs> right? But we can also act with that spirit, right? I do what I do without a sense of control. So you can still take the baby steps and be like, I relinquish control of the outcome. Whatever happens, Whatever happens, happens, right? So there, you know, there, there, I'll be right with you. There, there's really, I, I really have seen this in my life that I could not receive what God had for me as long as I was hanging on to what I wanted for me, right? As long as you're hanging on to that dream and you're like, ah! first of all, your whole life is ruined because you're like, <laughs> I have to have this, right? Second of all, you're not receiving, you can't, right? So at one point you have to be like, you know what? Whatever you want, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I give it all up, right? And at that moment, now the space is open, right? For, to receive this, this providence. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example and then I'll, I'll get your question. So when I finished grad school, um, I was struggling. I was afraid um, I wouldn't find a job, of course. <laughs> and I was really, really worried that I would have to end up teaching in the small town where my parents were teaching, <laughs> which was just the worst possible scenario. <laughs> so, and I was like, oh, I don't want to go there. Please not there. Please not there. And I, and I was not getting any answers. I was stuck in this kind of struggle. And I remember one point I went, we lived close to the very nice Lake Michigan. It was in Michigan. And I went there and I was like, I was suffering so much with like, I was so intent. I didn't want to be there. And I was suffering so much because I was scared it would happen. Because of course, God always does what you don't want him to do, right? He's always going to put you in places you don't want to go and <laughs> so forth, right? So I was, I was really knowing he would do it to me, like knowing. And so at one point I was like, you know what? I don't care. I'll go anywhere. I'll go here or I'll go to Kansas or, you know, Idaho, what the worst word. And I just relinquished control. <laughs> I just relinquished control. The next day I had a job interview for South, uh, North Carolina, which was amazing. Right. So it was, but I had to go through that inner struggle of letting go before I could receive. And God was not going to give me anything till I did that. Right. So I've learned this over and over again. So now it's like, it's just a technique. <laughs> like I, I know how to, I do it immediately now. It's like, you know, so this is really important, right? That we, we have to position ourselves to receive. And the only way is to relinquish our agendas. So we can get the divine destiny, right? Okay, now we're correct. <laughs> I was just thinking, like it sounds like a difficult balancing act because you can't be too passive, but you can't be too active either. Yeah, it's what he was saying. You do without the, because I still applied everywhere, including where my parents <laughs> were working, right? So I took the steps, but in my mind, I had let go. So of course you act, right? You do you do whatever action is there to be done, right? You don't sit at home waiting for on a platter, you know, the interview. You do, but you do it with a, with having let go psychologically. You see what I'm saying in that sense, right? So you do it's and by the way in the Tao Te Ching, <laughs> in the Chinese uh, philosophical text of the Tao Te Ching, they talk about action without action. It's exactly what they mean. You act without wanting to control the agenda, the, the result. You do what you do, and the result is not up to you. It, 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 it. You, you allow the nature to, you know, get you where you need to go. So it's a very similar idea, right, that we have here. Man plans and God laughs. Yes, he laughs. Yes, <laughs> very good. Okay, so that's where were we? Um, I don't even know where I am anymore. Yes. Okay. Here we are. Yes. Why? Uh, what's the connection between emptiness and abundance? Now we know. Okay, excellent. A another way to put this is that in a way she aligns with love, right? And therefore finds love. This is very interesting. It's like you kind of have to get yourself now to speak in a new agey <laughs> language. You got to get on the vibration of love to attract it, right? You have to be on a certain vibration or frequency to attract things on that frequency ruth wants to attract true love she has to become truly loving right so it's another very great advice if you're looking for love um it, be loving and you will attract love immediately right uh, and, and so this is kind of another thing right she she aligns anytime you align with love whatever decision that makes you make right you, you make doing all everything out of love you will eventually find love Right. This is an, another really, really important um, point, I think, because very often in the name of finding love, we give up on love 
for example, uh, you're in a relationship, uh, it's not working. Like, oh, I can't waste any more time on this person. <laughs> Let me move on, <laughs> right? In order to find love. It, we're missing something here, right? The, you can't find love by not being loving. So the idea of trying to be as loving as you can wherever life has put you is what will get you to your destination. In other words, you never waste time when you choose to love, right? Even if it looks to other people you're wasting time, you're not wasting time. You're aligning yourself with love and inevitably you will find love, right? That's kind of another, you can do a lot of new agey stuff with Ruth. Um, this is very interesting. Laws of attraction, everything, <laughs> everything is there, right? Okay, uh, anything else, anything else um, about what we can learn from this particular um, a connection. <clears throat> yeah. So we what should I call it? You drawing quotes from the Daniel I don't know how his last name, Hakik Tiri something. Yeah. <laughs> has been living rent free in my head a bit. <laughs> like I like the, the quote that you brought up from Rambam about how uh you should be as ready to kill like a, a woman <laughs> a foreign woman that you've suffered. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and uh, like I've been trying to like uh, think of that in my head and like reading into the interpretations of it, and I think it's somehow seen here where Naomi thinks she bears some sort of responsibility for the fate of her daughters, where she she says to them like I'm bit embittered on account of you, mm. and we were we were talking about it here where like who does the responsibility fall on when a, when a Jew has slept you know, outside of the, like... His, right, his right, nation. right, right. And the responsibility falls on the person with who the command is given to. Oh, that's a good on. point. That's a great and, rebuttal. See, so, that's why we need people like you to go to these events. <laughs> that's a great rebuttal because here, who suffers? Not Ruth or or, or Pius. The, the men die, right? Because they have broken that commandment. I like, that's a great rebuttal. Thank you. Very nice. Okay, good, good. Um, I want to say one more thing. Something that we don't often know. So what we're learning, what we're learning here, right, is 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 how how courageous her love is, right? She's ready to sacrifice everything, and then she finds love as a result, right? Even though she wasn't looking for it. And another thing we learn here is how strong you have to be to truly love, right? This is a she's she's described uh, again. I, I'll mention it as Eshet Hayil, woman. It's a horrible translation, woman of valor. Like she's like virtuous or something. It's not nothing to do with virtue. Chayil is a military metaphor. It it means literally soldier, right? Or so here we're seeing that what the real translation is a powerful or strong or you know a, give me some military. Yeah, yeah, powerful, strong. Like what what is another military way to say to talk about? power military power yeah, yeah warrior thank you <laughs> exactly so this is this is describing eshet highly is describing a war thank you i love Isn't it body, like translated as valiant like knight valiant like, yeah valiant is better but valor like as though she's virtuous therefore she's so great right they, they can't imagine that a woman can be a warrior right this is this is a woman who has a, who is as strong as a warrior when it comes to love it's as though what we're learning here is and she finds love right she really in a way yes exactly strong as death is love very nice yeah so what we're learning here is that it takes enormous courage grit warrior capabilities to truly love you you're not gonna make it see the the way we are trained as women in the victorian era which is still a little bit here is we are the weak ones <laughs> and we should be protected and cherished uh, and if that's not happening it's not the right person and so forth right we have this tendency uh some of us not all what we're learning here is that a real woman is not about that. She's not the weaker sex. She's a stronger sex, right? She's as strong as a warrior. And that in a way for her to cultivate the love in her marriage, in her relationship, is going to take warrior skills, right? We got to get rid of this notion of women as delicate who need to be, you know, like little, uh, you know, porcelain uh, dolls, right? This is, we're seeing a very different portrait of a woman here. We're seeing a woman who is powerful, who is a warrior, who is warring for love, right? She's she's just fighting through life 
um, with the intention of love. And this is in a way a very different model that we as women have, right? This notion of woman as warrior. Who else was a warrior in the ancient Near East? <laughs> we talked about a few goddesses. Which one was a warrior goddess? Hmm? In honor. Uh, kind of, but more someone in your culture, in your Babylonian culture. <laughs> Who was the equivalent of Inanna in the Babylonian culture? Ishtar, right? Ishtar was the warrior goddess, right? Who who fought to protect the king, right? We have an element here of warrior goddess traits, right? She, It, it takes a warrior goddess to truly love in this world, right? Love is not, we should stop seeing love as this, like they do in Hollywood, right? This nice story with like little flowers and whatever. I mean, of course, this is all nice, but ultimately you'll find out that for the love to last, you need to develop warrior skills and the woman, especially the man too, we will see with Boaz, right? But it starts with a woman. We have to stop being so fragile and delicate and, you know, um, this kind of princess's attitude because and and giving up so quickly, right? There's this notion that to truly make love work, we have to develop warrior skills, right? As women, and then we'll see Boaz, of course. I'm not having I haven't um, the men will get their share next time. So very nice. So just wanted to point that out, right? That this is a very different portrait. So maybe you can jot this down. This is a very different portrait of femininity that we're seeing in this text, right? This is not about the woman being beautiful like another text. Most other texts, when the woman is introduced, ah, she was beautiful of face and body, right? Like Rachel and even Esther. Um, and she was young, you know, untouched, right? Usually the women are virgins and beautiful. <laughs> this is the opposite. She's neither a virgin nor is she described in terms of her beauty. Probably then she's not beautiful. <laughs> Otherwise the text would have, you know, underlined it, right? So she's probably not beautiful, but she's a powerful woman. And, and this is a very different portrait of femininity than we're used to. And, and, and this is the this is in a way the, the, the attributes that we need to develop as women to truly build our house, to truly nurture a loving relationship. It will take those skills, right? There's no need to describe it physically because beauty lies in her capacity. <laughs> exactly. She's strong physically and she's strong mentally. Exactly. Yes. She's very strong physically too. We see her in the fields, right? Uh, gleaning all day more than the others, right? So very different portrait um, that I wanted to submit. Okay, excellent. So um, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, oh yeah, I wanted to say one more thing. Um, I wanted to highlight some other philosophical texts on the notion of love as not a feeling, but as a force, right? We see here that through her love, she shifts her own destiny and the destiny of others, right? There is in a way, the fact that she loved so deeply kind of was the factor that shifted her destiny, right? So love here is seen not as an emotion, but as a force. Who else spoke of love as a force in the American context? We have a very famous speaker who talked about love as a political force that could shift the tide of nations. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, nope. the course of no. uh, Martin Luther King. Yes, Martin Luther King. Read the book, The Strength to Love, please. <laughs> Companion book to Ruth, <laughs> right? Exactly. You should read the two together. It's very powerful. He talks about love as a political force. Remember that his idea was a nonviolent resistance, and he believed that this was uh, he believed that this was a form of love. And he says love is in can be, and he got this from Gandhi, by the way. This is an idea that uh, can be traced back to the Upanishads, to the Bhagavad Gita. This is an idea that traveled right uh, from India to Gandhi to him. They they had met, right? They 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 shared ideas. So this idea that love is is more powerful than uh, violence, right? In order to effectuate change, there is a power of love. And this is kind of what I'm seeing. So I really invite you like some really interesting exercises to grab the book, The Strength to Love by Martin Luther King and to read through it within mind, the book of Ruth and you will see their amazing connections, right? He talks about loving in a way that is tough, right? He talks about tough love, the importance of, of sometimes being tough in love in order to, push you know what 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 is just so very very similar here right we see that love is a force that can change and shift not only the destiny of a individual destiny but her love shift the whole destiny of israel we're going to see 
that she is able to reopen a breach onto the messianic line that had been closed, right? So she shifts not only her destiny, not only Naomi's destiny, not only Boaz, not only Bethlehem, but the whole kingdom of Israel is revived through her one decision to love no matter what. So we have to realize how much as an individual, if we make the choice of Ruth to love no matter what, which is what she's doing um, of sacrificial love, that can have humongous repercussions way beyond our own family, right? There's there's a power to love. That's why she's called Eshet Chayil, right? Military metaphor. Uh, is, that, is that a question? No, just hand. Okay, very good. Anything else? All right, next time we're going to look at the seduction of Boaz. And we're going to see now Boaz is going to rise um, in, in a very... Uh, kind of reflecting very much uh, Ruth's character. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, how she seduces him. And then we're going to talk about how he redeems her. She, in a way, redeems him and he re redeems her. We're going to look at that interaction. So next time, just finish the book, reading assignment on chapters three and four. And then uh, we'll finish up the book of Ruth. All right. Thank you all. So Davidovich, was it so bad? Davidovich, was it so bad? You survived? Okay. <laughs>